next up, we have Amy Wittison to talk about the woman of tomorrow. Sally Rand and her fans change the world. All right, everyone, we're back from break. It's the sixth season. Some of us have been here a long time. So grab your seats, grab your drinks. We've got another act, and I'm very happy to be here. Um, I was told by a friend of mine and fellow speaker, Aaron Lakehook, that I should make a joke about the spectacles I was wearing. I said I'd do it. <laughs> I'm hilarious. All right, everyone, everyone. Imagine this, Market Street is occupied by a bevy of beautiful women, 47 of them to be precise, astride on high horses to advertise a nude ranch, to promote a place where normal everyday humans could pay a fee and watch women clad only in cowboy hats, boots, holsters, and their smiles. Watching them, quote, participate vigorously in various outdoor sports. <laughs> what year is this, everyone? No, it's not today. It's not the 90s. It's not the 70s, for that matter. Close. February 17th, 1939. As San Francisco prepared to welcome the world at the Golden Gate International Exposition, the cowgirls of the nude ranch prepare to welcome oglers, I mean patrons, I mean patrons, from around the country. There was another photo, it had butts in it, and I just thought I would be, you know, sensitive to those who are sensitive. Now, now, hold on, hold on. Would it surprise you all to find out that years later, in 1946, the creator, the mistress of this motley crew of women, the entrepreneurial leader of these 40 acres of fun, it was 40 acres, a bleach blonde bombshell known worldwide for her intoxicating stage presence, who'd performed for millions on or near every World's Fair since 1933, would be arrested in San Francisco and charged with, quote, indecent exposure, corrupting the morals of an audience, and conducting an obscene show. Everyone, it is my pleasure to introduce you to and to reintroduce for some of you, Ms. Sally Rands. <laughs> uh, and let me say off the top, she is a legend in burlesque circles. I am, I'm sure there are some of you who could get up and do this talk much better than I. I'm gonna do the best I can, but she was an actress, she was a vaudeville performer and a burlesque dancer who took the world by storm for decades. Best known for originating the ostrich feather fan dance. Wherein she twisted and twirled said fans around her body providing tantalizing glimpse of naked skin. Was she naked? Was she not? In an age emerging from the complicated Victorian slash Edwardian relationship with sex, Rand's scandalizing dance sold and sold well. She kicked off an international craze and more lawsuits than you can count. Before I get going, I just want to give credit to the book that kind of provided me with the structure for this talk. I really suggest you go and read this. Uh, it's a fantastic piece. Uh, we'll come back to it. Feuding fan dancers, Faith Bacon, Sally Rand, and the golden age of the showgirl. So Sally Rand, here she is, born Helen Gould back on April 3rd, 1904 in the Ozarks. She was a scrappy little menace to propriety from the start. As legend has it, little Helen Beck ran away to perform with the circus at age 13 and soon began dancing as a chorus girl in vaudeville shows, which also may have meant that she posed nude at 13 because it was a terrible time. Um, <laughs> she was a dancer and an acrobat but she truly longed to be an actor. She performed opposite, actually, in a play, a young and unknown dude named Humphrey Bogart. I don't know if you've heard of him. Um, back then, she was known as Billy Beck, a name that was only changed when Cecil B. DeMille, yes, that one, thank you, that was for you, um, saw a Rand McNally Atlas and gave her a new surname to go with her chosen first name, Sally, that she'd already picked out. Now at this point, is this talk risking consisting of just amazing deco covers of Rand McNally atlases? Yeah. Yeah. It totally is. Okay, just one more. 
This was why my slides were late. <laughs> So anyway, Sally went to California, and she had roles in a few silent movies. But when the talkies hit, she blamed her career sputter on that shift to actresses who could talk. <laughs> but what's that you say? You aren't familiar with this time, this huge sea change that took place when movies suddenly had sound? You mean you haven't seen the mass massively fictionalized take? You have to see this movie. It's my favorite movie. Anyway, <laughs> yeah. Um, so Sally, she kind of couldn't catch her teeth in the movie industry, so she ended up heading to Chicago. And when the Great Depression hit, she turned to the more exotic styles of dancing um, and found herself in Chicago as the Century of Progress Exposition was opening. Supposedly, after she was turned down numerous times trying to get a, um, a more official job within the fair, uh, she got on a horse and she rode... <laughs> I'll take it. I'll allow, yeah, I'll allow it. <laughs> um, she got on a horse, a white horse, and rode naked into a party hosted by Chicago's genteel ladies. An alleged protest she claimed she was making because these women were dining in their finest while the rest of the country was in breadlines. Yes, she was arrested. But her audacious stunt got her noticed. But it was this dance, this glorious fan dance that made her famous and kept her dancing into her 70s. This dance, which I very nearly just included the whole thing and that was going to be my talk, um, is one of the most famous and revered burlesque stalwarts. In the dance, she comes on stage initially clothed, clothed excuse me, with two big ostrich feather fans. She r r uh, moves them around, then goes off behind a scrum that's being lit from the, the back, and suddenly she is clothless. She's naked. Or is she naked? We don't know. Then she would come out with the fans and twirl them and obscure her body in ways that people were wondering whether they were seeing more of the show or less. Um, this dance was performed to Claire de Lune and some Chopin as well, and it was a huge hit and allegedly generated so much new revenue that she was credited with saving that fair. From here, she took over the world. She was beloved, yet vil vilified, arrested numerous times, protested, and celebrated. But I want to stop here for a moment. I say legend and supposedly and allegedly because in her book, Zemeckis does a wonderful job of pointing out how much of Sally's mythology was just that, a myth that she helped tell, a narrative and story that she set out to share with the world. She was known to fib slash lie occasionally about things in order to show herself in the best light, and she would change her background. So did Sally come up with that fan dance on her own? Probably not. There were other women that were doing a similar dance around the same time at the same fair. And she might have taken it straight from the other subject of the book, Faith Bacon. Read the book, you'll find out. Um, are her stories of Hollywood success greatly exaggerated? Probably. It's more apparent that she didn't break into film really until after her fan dancing became a thing. And then her, her positions in these movies often involved that dance as a part of her, her shtick. And sure, she was ten thousands of dollars in debt to the IRS because I guess her fan dance didn't involve drying the ink on a tax check. Yes! <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> And so many people, including nudists, weren't her fans, pun intended. <laughs> um, not intended, I didn't notice I did it. So not only did the nudists not like her, she herself, Sally, sneered at strip teasers. That is a quote from her Washington Post obituary, <laughs> claiming that her dancing was an art while theirs was filth and, and low class despite the fact that she was often billed by the venues she was performing at as a, quote, number one stripper. <laughs> but I just want to say, whether any of her myth is true or not, Sally Rand was a fucking formidable woman who knew how to hustle. She worked her much-viewed butt off to squeeze every ounce of opportunity out of her adventures. She was fierce. Of her, it was said, she was such a great lady, but a bitch on wheels. I want that in my obituary. <laughs> My friends, I'm obsessed with this woman. I went down so many rabbit holes researching this, which is why working on this talk went until three in the morning. But anyway, there are at least three other odd salon talks in this, and I encourage one of you to pitch them, or three of you. She was a hustler and a workhorse. She performed after, as she got older, she performed for children's events and exhibitions. I couldn't find it, but probably bar mitzvahs. She was told while well, she was in Hollywood that her legs were too athletic and that she was too big for Hollywood. 
But she was rumored after that to do 16 shows a day. And those were big fans. And for a time, her and Mae West were the, Mae West, excuse me, were the top earners in entertainment in, in the United States. She knew how to generate interest. She tantalized men and women alike with a, is she or isn't she wearing anything? As Sally would sh say, she'd say, come and see the show, or quote, the rand is quicker than the eye. <laughs> Which, by the way, is a catchphrase she may have stolen from someone else. Read the book, it's good. <laughs> Really nice pants. I like the pants in that. Um, she created a performance company afterwards. They toured. They were part of the, the nude ranch that employed 50 people. She physically helped build sets. She sewed costumes. She did her own PR. She gave new burlesque dancers their big break. I haven't even touched on the fact that in the book they talk about how she was a pilot who dated Lindbergh and flew herself to gigs. We don't have time for that. She was political, and after she was arrested in San Francisco, she performed in long underwear with a sign saying, censored by the SFPD. <laughs> and she ferociously protected her livelihood, which was her body. She was charged with battery after she beat up a fan who secretly took an upskirt shot on her, essentially. I believe she was acquitted. Okay, we need one more shot of the cowgirls. Friends, if I ever get married again, this is the bridal party shot, FYI. Okay, sorry, I added the censoring to this too because I just didn't know. Um, she, <laughs> she was famously quoted as saying, I haven't been out of work since the day I took my pants off. And we, we, we joke about the pants part, but let's think about the work part. She turned her career into a long-running, lifelong endeavor. She purchased the music box in San Francisco, which many of you probably know as the Great American Music Hall. She lectured at Harvard. She campaigned for a presidential candidate. She bought homes in New Mexico, Montana, California, Connecticut, and you know what? She did it into her 70s. That's right, into her 70s, people. She made cash money dancing with her wits and her fans and not much else for 45 years. And in a world gripped by the Great Depression at the top of her career, at a time when women didn't have power or autonomy in the ways some of us do now, Sally Rand took a look down upon but consumed profession and she turned it into her own empire. And that is significant, as many other historians have placed her work within the male gaze and not in terms of what she was achieving on her own. But as she said in the book, these working women, though some Latter-day historians decry them as commodities, were also seen as emancipated from husbands and families. Sally had a few marriages, but I'm not talking about them because frankly, they don't matter in terms of her story. She, as a single woman in the 40s, adopted a son. And that trial I mentioned, after the judge insisted that everyone in the court decamp to the Savoy Club to watch the offending performance, <laughs> At the end of the trial, the judge stated, quote, anyone who could find something lewd about the dance, as she puts it on, has to have a perverted ideal of morals. He pronounced her not guilty. So I leave you tonight with Sally's own words. Quote, I have been successful, and I am grateful for my success. I have had some experiences that I wish I never had had, but that would be true in any business. I cannot say sincerely I would have chosen just this road to fortune. Perhaps I might have wished it another way, but I took the opportunity that came to me. So let us this evening raise our glass to Sally Rand and to taking every opportunity that comes to us. Cheers. Thank you, Amy, that was phenomenal. <coughs> Phenomenal talk on a phenomenal lady. And that judge knew what was up. <laughs> up next, presenting a story of scandal, we have for his third Odd Salon talk. <laughs> ah. Edmund Zagarin will be speaking on Nazis in the toy store or how a white 